So just a little bit more about me. I was born in the Gambia in West Africa, a tiny little country. And when I was 13, my parents moved to the United States, to uh, UK, to take on a position there. And uh, at that time, it was the, in the 60s, in the height of uh, the racial tension. And what they hadn't taught me was what it was going to, be feel like, to feel like to be the only uh, student of color in my high school. And I would say that during those first years, I did struggle quite a bit um, in terms of my academic grades. Well, maybe it was the fact that I was the only student of color, but of course there was the swinging 60s and the having fun on the King's Road. So maybe that had uh, something to do with it as well. And then I left uh, at the end of my uh, high school years and took a job as a microbio in a microbiology lab. And there, instantly, within a few weeks, I began to feel this excitement of doing science. And it really didn't take long enough to correct my study habits to be able to actually enter university and study biochemistry. And as I was studying biochemistry, I came to learn about the application of what I was learning into health issues and diseases. And so as a consequence of that, when I had completed uh, my biochemistry undergraduate degree, I went to uh, St. George's Hospital to do medicine. It was a time when they were very interested in recruiting mature students. So at the age of 23, I started my medical um, career there. As, a, as you heard, I did my, all my training and my clinical fellowship in cardiology in London and decided to go to America to get my BTA. And if anybody is wondering what that is, it's been to America. <laughs> because at that time, um, America was in greatly in advance in cardiology uh, compared to, uh, to England. So I went there to get my BTA, which was supposed to take a year or two, but that ended up to be 30 years because I, I got recruited into the faculty um, and um, stayed there. And um, so I was minding my own business when uh, Dr. Collins uh, uh, called me to actually come to the NIH to take on this responsibility of leading uh, NIH new diversity efforts. And the position is twofold. I'll talk about the diversity side of it in a moment, but part of the allure of doing this was going, being able to continue my research. And what I do at the NIH in my lab is to use genomic approaches, genomic tools, to monitor patients after organ transplantation so that we can actually pick up um, uh, uh, changes in their, uh, in their hearts before they fully reject the organ. And that is why I chose the song because one of my patients once said to me, Dr. Valentine, I can't really understand this. First you give me a new heart, then you take it away bit by bit with all of these biopsies. And with that, I was then very dedicated to come up with ways that we could avoid having these nasty heart biopsies. And here's a schematic of what I do. Imagine a patient, we now think of the transplant essentially as a genome transplant, but as it turns out, all of us have little fragments of DNA in our bloodstream circulating here as depicted in red. And, but when you put in a graft uh, uh, that is from somebody else, you have a new set of genomes. And of course, depicted in green, you can calculate the amount of the, don that, uh, of the DNA is, that is coming from the uh, donor and right away have a non-invasive test of diagnosing rejection. So in addition to using these new technologies, we are actually using, uh, looking at, using them to look at mechanisms. So there we are. So um, in this first few uh, couple of years at NIH, I've put together a consortium of the local heart and lung transplant centers. 
we're collecting biospecimens and, and patient and information, and we'll be able to actually do the work there. The wonderful thing is that with that cohort, it's actually 40% who are African American. And you can see that now we'll be able to address that uh, health disparity issue that when, uh, when patients from an, uh, from an underrepresented group have an organ transplant, they seem to do a lot worse than others. And so that is another reason you heard from your president about what, why diversity matters. Another reason is that we'll be able to, uh, it's important to be able to health, uh, approach health disparities. So NIH actually has been thinking about this and doing this for a long time. And we really now believe that diversity is critically important, not only for approaching health disparities and optimization of care, but the diversity of thought, the diversity of experiences leads in and of itself to better science, better creative thinking, and a lot more opportunity to do that. So Dr. Collins and I, in thinking about this, in the first few months when I was at NIH, came up with a framework that is an actionable framework that we can take all this thinking uh, and theorizing about diversity and actually put it into action. And we envisage four pillars and four challenges that if we were able to address successfully, we would be actually moving the, the needle in a way that we haven't done before. The first is the science of diversity. To what extent does diversity in teams lead to and support better science? The second one is we know that NIH and many others have been focused a lot on uh, recruitment, retention of students right from the undergrad and even before, and moving them to the pipeline. The, the problem is we don't actually know what actually works and what doesn't, and for whom, and in what context. And so we have developed new programs, which I'll show you to try to address this. The third area that we envisage has been really not used and thought of very much is to do with the social and cultural factors that get in the way of us diversifying our scientific workforce. And I'll speak about that. And then when all is said and done, We've all known about one program being developed in one institution, and when you try to replicate it in somewhere else, it doesn't seem to work. What are the ways can we do, what are the things that can we do to really sustain diversity in the scientific workforce? Let's talk first about uh, the science of diversity. So um, much of the information of the science of diversity, meaning linking diversity in the workforce with the quality and outputs, comes from various other arenas outside science. For example, we know that um, if you get a heterogeneous, racially heterogeneous group of jurors uh, in the law, they are more likely to make better decisions when they're adjudicating about a particular case. We also know that if you have a heterogeneous group of traders, uh, financial traders, they make better decisions and end up being, uh, making fewer mistakes. In the scientific world, we're just beginning to gather that data as shown on this slide here, where they, uh, the investigators looked at over two million papers and using surnames as a proxy for diversity, found that those uh, uh, papers that were containing uh, authors that were from diverse backgrounds were uh, more often cited, they were published in, more, in higher, uh, more prestigious journals, and in fact, we know that the same is true for women. So we're beginning to get that data that links diversity of the workforce itself with the quality of science, but we concluded that we need a little bit more uh, of that evidence. So what about this whole area about um, recruitment, knowing how to do this? And um, we have uh, figured out that we really need more work in this uh, area. And the diversity consortium program, which is composed of the bills, 
building uh, diversity leading to infrastructure, the National Mentoring Network and the Center for Coordination is this uh, program that was launched a couple of years ago. And here I'm showing you that that the investment that NIH is doing, uh, making in this arena. It is not actually just, um, build, uh, just uh, continuing with what was done, but this is really new. And what we have here is these 10 different experiments, 10 sites have been awarded to do this work. And so the work that they do not only has the program that they're trying to implement, but they have control groups. They're working towards similar endpoints so that at the end of the day, all of the data can be collected and we can really figure out what works and for whom. Um, I put this up there to show you the diversity of the recipients of the BUILD and NRM Award. We have Hispanic serving institutions, we have historically black colleges, and many others. And what we're seeing is that there are a number of key hypotheses being tested within these 10 different experiments. Th stereotype threat is being looked at, this fear of succumbing to a negative stereotype associated with your own identity group, which actually leads in diminishing your performance. What can we do about that? Um, there are programs in entrepreneurship, living and learning communities, and many others. And the National Mentoring Network itself has been extremely powerful, and we believe it's going to be wildly successful. It's linking mentors who would not usually have the right kind of uh, mentees, who would not usually have the right kind of mentors with, mentee, with mentors uh, across the country. It's training mentors to be able to, tr to mentor appropriately um, and getting away from this idea that just because you're a great scientist and published in Nature and Cell that you're automatically a good mentor. And um, you can see the power and extent of it is happening just in the space of two years. A large numbers of people are being already touched by this program. Let's turn for a moment then about the social and psychological and cultural factors. We know that in fact, stereotypes in our minds force us to make decisions when we are faced with making them rapidly. And these stereotypes uh, get in the way of making the right decision even when we have um, certain data in front of us. We also know, for example, that if you go to uh, little children uh, at grade uh, kindergarten uh, to second grade and ask them to draw a scientist, over 60% of them will draw the classical white male as, as a scientist. But those experiments were low, were, were a long time ago. Now, more recently, this experiment shown up here was done, where the researchers went through the net and took pictures, actual pictures of faculty member across the nation. And they got um, them graded by some students for the degree of masculinity or femininity. And then they got a separate group of stu uh, students to say whether this picture was likely to be a, a, a scientist or a teacher. And um, so here are the kinds of pictures here that they got. And what was amazing was the fact that the, for the women, feminine traits were, the more feminine a woman looked, the more likely she was be to be, uh, to be a teacher and not a scientist. For a man, it didn't make any difference at all. I've talked about the drawer scientist experiments. We know that re resumes, in resume studies, women are much less likely uh, to be hired as scientists. They receive less pay, and they're less likely to be mentored. Letters of references actually look very different for men and for women. And even in grant reviews, you can see that more recent data is showing that the kinds of words that reviewers use to describe uh, the grant applications from women is different from the kinds of w words that they use from men, raising the question as whether they're viewing these applications rather differently. So we know that there are these filters that exist 
that uh, get in the way. For example, one word journals. You have to have a one word journal, science, nature, otherwise you're not going and it affects it as the reviewer uh, uh, reviews your resume. Um, the institution that you come from has been shown to make a difference. Um, and at the end of the day, the reviewers are looking for people just like themselves, as this uh, shown in this cartoon here. If you want to be really taken seriously as a scientist, at least try to look like the scientist. So what's NIH doing about it? We're doing trans-NIH unconscious bias education uh, for all of the search committees, and we're asking the question whether or not this education actually made a difference, firstly, in the measured implicit attitude test, and secondly, in the behavior as reflected by who they are hiring. And finally then, when we've done all of this, how can we sustain uh, this work and disseminate it? Um, one of the things that I really believe gets in the way is the metaphor of a pipeline. And it served us very well 20 years ago, I believe. Uh, but it is, I think it is um, getting in the way of us really considering what we need to consider. Because what we have is not really a pipeline. We often have a series of short, unconnected pipes. And this actually gets in the way of us thinking more broadly about this as a systems-based uh, approach to this work. And my great colleague here, um, Kenny Gibbs, has shown that, in fact, there is a workforce ready to go that is diverse at the postdoctoral level and the graduate student level um, that is not being tapped into. So the underrepresented students now coming out of grad schools is over 1,000 each year and it represents a seven-fold growth, and yet their hiring as assistant professors has not increased appropriately. So filling in the pipeline is necessary, but not su sufficient. And I'll draw you to a thought experiment that Kenny suggested to us. The, the AMC institutions, which are about 150, hire 1,000 professors each year. Let us say, for example, they were to hire 10% who were from the underrepresented group. That would be 100. And so if only two-thirds of those, only two-thirds, hired one person from an underrepresented group, we would be bridging the gap that is, uh, uh, and reaching that level of hiring to 10%. So this work can be done, should be done, it can be done tomorrow, and within four or five years, we would have c closed that hiring uh, gap. What about, so with that in mind, let's find, finish up with talking about sustainability. I think what we need now is an integrated uh, strategy for scientific workforce diversity that links across the various stage of the career path as you go from high school, and you might even argue uh, beginning early, right through to leadership. Um, we have the overarching goal of something like this would be to eliminate uh, the barriers. So as soon as people move from one stage to the other, we lose them through, through those barriers. And so creating approaches that can eliminate those barriers, I think will be wildly uh, helpful and drawing on evidence that we already uh, have. And so this is what we hope will happen. So let me just throw out the uh, theoretical model of how it will look like. And by the way, your leadership at SACNES is working directly with NIH to actually figure this out, how a, an integrated approach might work. So you would have, um, at the institutions, uh, uh, um, center, uh, mentoring and training. And now you're preparing people not only for academia, but for all of the other professions that are essential for supporting uh, the biomedical research. But at the core of this, you would have an engine, I call it. I like to call it an engine, because this engine would be the, the place where we are developing new uh, ways of recruiting, retaining, uh, ways of addressing the social and cultural factors that, uh, so it would have to be an interdisciplinary team made up not only by scientists, but by social scientists, 
by uh, people from business and, and, and across the field that would teach us how to rapidly scale what we know and get people ready for STEM jobs. So let me just end by saying that um, I'm often asked how on earth could I have left this paradise of California and go to the NIH and Bethesda? And I argue that in fact, aside from all of those wonderful opportunities that I've just already described to you, this is a picture taken from my backyard um, just last year after a major snowstorm. And when there is this snowstorm, you all stay home and enjoy yourself uh, in various ways. And I've never seen anything so dramatic as this, especially somebody coming from Africa. And um, I wanted to just introduce you to my family uh, who allow me this uh, great indulgence to travel the world and talk about not only my science, but also science of diversity. Here we are in Sausalito, one of our favorite places where they took me for Mother's Day, enjoying, and our daughters, uh, Erica and Natasha, and my husband, uh, who, uh, with Erica being also a, a, a scientist. Uh, and here is when she uh, did her first white coat ceremony, but who grabs the stethoscope is the, uh, actually the person who works at Facebook as a product marketing manager, her sister, and having great fun there. And here's how we spend our times when we get together at Christmas. And then finally, let me just end by my, one of the favorite sayings from Albert Einstein, whom you all know was a great activist and a supporter of social justice is that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And I would say that goes true for science as it does for diversity. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>